I stared up into the bright light, smiling from ear to ear. The door clanked and the security droid stepped forward. The droid asked, Welcome, Miss Ara Fort. Please present your ID card. I lifted the ID card hanging around my neck. The droid's red eyes glossed over it and beamed into the ID surface with its retinal scanner. After a resounding beep, the droid turned toward me and said, You are clear to go, Miss R. Rockfort. Thank you, I said. I walked past the security and into the compound. Pristine air, clean metal walls, sharp cuts in the polygonal designs of the corridors complemented the studded rivets of the centre flooring and the glass wall fixtures showing the various labs within this space station. This was the KG-6 space station. It was one of the corporation's many galaxy outposts. This one was a lot closer to civilization, since it was orbiting around the planet that I called home, Mordo. To think I would get the opportunity to be working at Fujikawa Corp, the most innovative company within the Milky Way and possibly the universe. The moaning of someone drew my attention to the bed being rolled toward me, with droids moving with it. On that bed was a man, shivering under a reddened smeared sheet, like a frigid cold gripped his body. But that wasn't what was plaguing him. Blood dripped from his stained arm that hung over the side of the bed. My throat bloated with sickness as I looked up and avoided looking at the man as he passed me in the hall. Yes, and sometimes in any dedicated scientific pursuit of discovery, danger was expected, of course. I wasn't scared, and I was determined to prove my worth and eventually get an opportunity to show my talent. And who better to do it with than Fujikawa? Fujikawa was the company that revolutionized space travel, and as such got first mover privileges that enabled them to take much control over the development of many colonies Earth settled in. Many companies came after, but Fujikawa was the first, and as the leader in the universe for anything related to space exploration, ship construction, space mining, and viral serum research among many others, the competition to get into the company was tight. But I achieved it, and definitely was going to shine as the new biological engineer within their ranks. For me, I was here because of my speciality in the ecology of animals, so my primary role was to oversee what they called the Living Garden. This was a self-contained center holding creatures from different alien planets. I've only been here a week now and I've only seen a glimpse of the Living Garden from the viewing platform. So I have been working mostly in the analytics room with the other young interns at the company. Hopefully, in time, I can get the trust of my coworkers and supervisor to be allowed to interact with the many creatures. I reached within my department and quickly changed all of my clothing to the sanitary work garbs we were supposed to wear and the specifics of wearing them. Hopefully I followed the rules this time. The last time, my supervisor chewed me out for not buttoning up my overcoat and not using the protective goggles properly. It was disappointing, but I understood his worry. My job was filled with a lot of hazards after all. Once I walked into the main transition area, which was empty outside of the janitor. Mr. Smith stomped into the area, and already I started sweating. Rockfort, you're late. Mr. Smith said. This was Smith. He was my supervisor, and technically the most hated person within the bioweaponry division. Yes, this was the division I was working under. The Living Garden, though it contained a lot of wonderful and interesting creatures, those living creatures were also the most dangerous and this division was in charge of not only monitoring them, but also learning from their biological makeup in order to not only make weapons, but also to produce defensive measures against them. Our efforts to conquer and colonize the universe didn't come without hiccups or resistance. Many of these creatures were aliens to us, and naturally put up a fight against any attempt to colonize their planets. We may have won, but that didn't mean that these aliens were defeated. I replied, Sorry, sir. The shuttle had some technical difficulties on its lift. I told you that it would be better if you actually lived inside the space station rather than be taking a shuttle to work twice a week. He said. 
I was going to be here for the next 72 hours, so it was going to be a long haul for sure. I'm still thinking about it. Sleeping away from home still feels weird to me. Mr. Smith's eyebrows raised before he frowned. <sighs> Think of it this way. It depends on how badly you want to prove your dedication to the company. If you're sleeping here, it's easy for you to get up in case of an emergency where you might be needed. One thing about this company is they like people that dedicate themselves to their work. You're too wishy-washy. You, you've got to go with it. Be flexible. Just my advice. I nodded my head and said, Understood, sir. That emergency came quicker than I thought, though, Mr. Smith said. Well, I am glad you understand, because I have a proposition for you. I said, yes, what is it, sir? I was looking at your CV, and it annotated that you used to work at the Defense Department on Earth, yes? I raised my head in pride. Yes, I used to work in the Anti-Biological Warfare Initiative, and received great praise from my superiors for my report on the Rage Virus. Yes, we know, Rockford. That's why we hired you. But I'm more interested in your expertise with your study of the Asmoth. Asmoth. It was a creature that human explorers encountered in 2452. Thirty years ago, the horrors that creature crafted in the minds of human marines and explorers back then is still fresh in people's minds through the stories that have been told of that creature's brutality and efficient killing ability. I nodded my head. Yes, I've studied them. It is from their planet that the rage virus originates from. Those creatures are immune to it. Well, your work on the virus is nice and all. It's time for you to study the thing that makes the virus seem tame. Recently, we've become understaffed in the Asmoth environment of the Living Garden, where those aliens are housed. Since you have some experience with them, we would like for you to help with the workload. Pictures and diagrams are all I've ever seen of that creature. But this was the first time I was going to be able to see an Asmoth right in my face. This was something that I wanted to do, but the opportunity was dropped in my lap a little too quickly. So I was apprehensive for sure. I said, so I'm going to be studying the Asmoth? Smith must have detected my fear and said, don't worry, there's other experienced members there. We just need somebody to do a round of tests on our aliens and assist the others. Just follow their lead. I became more confident and nodded my head in affirmation. Right. Taking my stuff, I took the elevator down to the living garden. It was so huge. For it was one of the things that you can see from the upper platform. But once I was level with the high walls and 80-foot cages... I felt small and insignificant. A droid came to my assistance and escorted me to the Living Garden's work platform. It was a series of self-contained labs circling the glass dome that held the creatures within. We walked the large passageway around the tall curve of the dome, covering the huge land of grass, lakes, trees, and earth. Many of them were separated by high walls cutting through the huge landscape sitting within the center of the space station. All of these environments were created for each specific creature. So some were normal, like my planet, and Earth, with grass and artificial rivers running along the sandstone. While some were harsh, with lava spewing out onto the dark, glass-like stone with gothic-shaped hills carved out of the land. I was ushered into a connecting room Two men were already inside and chuckling amongst each other. A series of beeps came from the droid, and they both looked up in surprise. One of the men said, Oh, thought it was his royal highness. Who was the royal highness? As much as I wanted to ask, both of the men already started walking away. The droid spoke, Smith has stationed a new person, Miss Rockfort, to this unit. The two men kept walking and didn't turn around. I guess they didn't want to talk. Still, that was rude. The droid didn't take any offense to that and continued guiding me, until we ran into the leader of this operation, Mr. Hendrick. 
Hendrik looked like an old, grizzled vet. And, as I would find out, he was. For he was a former space explorer for the company. He was already notified by Smith that I would be placed under their tutelage. I was never made to feel special. Once Mr. Hendrick laid down the ground rules, I was sent to work, and oh jeez, it was rough. There were only three azimuths here, but my duties went beyond just testing the creature's vital signs and overall health. I also had to check the climate and the earth quality, among other odd variables of their living environment. Did we need all of this information, was the question I asked myself, and I was sure a lot of my co-workers asked themselves that. I didn't ask too many questions after a while, mostly because people didn't want to answer them. Many of the people here were rude and expected me to learn on my own, thinking the answers were obvious enough. That wasn't very helpful to me, but I gripped my teeth and focused on my work. After a few days, Clifton was back on duty, because he was suspended when I first came in. He talked to me, and was way more sociable than the others. It made me wonder why he was suspended. Anyways, today I was taking blood samples from each of the Asmoth. Opening the secured flap, I pierced the needle into the Asmoth's red-skinned arm that was extended to me. A hard, transparent wall, coursed with metal vines, separated us from them. The Asmoths were short and had speckles from their upper arms to the bottom of their jawline. Their cat-like eyes were very direct when they looked at me, or any of the other members, but overall they were docile. It was weird for me, because their reputation was truly something of legend, so I expected them to be wild beasts. I guess the written portrayals were a bit exaggerated. One thing that was not exaggerated was their speed. They moved fast, and could extend their claws to be even more deadly. You got the blood, Rihanna? Clifton asked when he came around. I drew the blood and snapped the side of the cylinder. Yep, got it. My hand reached for the syringe of simulant's fluid, which I injected into the Asmoth's arm. There you go, I said. The Asmoth pulled their arm in and I closed the flap. Change to X-ray, I said. The wall immediately changed to an X-ray screen that showed the bone and organ structure of the Asmoths as they ran over their rocky environment, with their sporadic ferns and grass. I said, these Asmoths are truly amazing creatures, don't you think? This one, the one's blood sample that I just took. He likes to arrange those stones like he's setting a trap. It's kind of cute. Clifton said, I wouldn't be humanizing them too much, Rihanna. I'm not humanizing them. I'm just saying, they're an intelligent species. They're not super intelligent. They're just good hunters. Clifton said. I frowned at him. He laughed. Just being honest. Anyway, good that you like working here. And you don't? I asked. He made a facial shrug. It's alright. Clifton acted so stuck up, but at least he talked to me, unlike the others. To think that they build all of this on a space station, I said. In a way, they had to. They could never build a place like this on any of the colony planets, Clifton said. And that technically means if they get out, at least nobody gets hurt, except the people on the station. I shuddered to hear that stark reality, but I understood it. That also mean we were on our own if that would happen. Still, for his mind to go there, I had to ask. Sounds like you're talking from experience. He shrugged. It happens at least once a month. What? Hmm? He looked genuinely surprised. Oh, nobody told you? Of course nobody told me that these creatures break out once a month to say hi. I said in sarcasm, but my heart was booming a loud tremor at this unwelcome news. Clifton rubbed the back of his neck. Yeah, Smith. His Royal Highness has been asking for them to replace the wall and add improvements to the place, but they haven't improved anything. <sighs> Promises are the only thing we get. I gasped and said, So what about the safety of the engineers and scientists in the Living Garden? Clifton said, we're disposable. The wall here is not that good and the security measures have been inconsistent and glitchy. But the wall behind us, that separates the living garden from everywhere else, is better. And that's where the improvements go. If you get what I mean. My heart sank. 
So, wait, so what are we? Meat for the slaughter? No, it would be better to say they underestimated the extent of security needed to secure all these creatures. The Tiamats are too big to deal with, the acid of the Garnets constantly cause problems, and the destructive violence of the Eurobound has led to the death of five people up until now. They just want their reports, and tend to think we need to toughen up. Anyone that doesn't, they quit, and a lot of people have quit. I finally remembered. That person that got injured. Was that the reason? He said... It's usually the reason. You just started working here. So everything seems calm now, but I expect you to leave very soon. That was expected, considering what he and many others have seen before. It would explain why they didn't talk to me. I guess they were resisting the idea of getting to know me because they didn't think I would last. This was still unforgivable. They should be more serious about security and safety in this place. And I'm not saying this because I'm scared. I was just worried about everyone else. Clifton laughed. <laughs> I agree, but you better keep that to yourself. The last time I said that, I got suspended. Oh, so that was the reason he got suspended. Mr. Smith should do better, I said. Clifton shook his head. Nope, it's not him. To be honest, he's the one keeping things in line here, because it's not only this place, it's also the people. The people? Clifton walked away laughing. <laughs> That one I won't tell you about. You'll see what I mean soon enough. That didn't take long either for me to find out. At the end of my shift, a bunch of new people were let into the Living Garden Science Facilities. They weren't wearing any safety gear, and they weren't behaving in a manner that showed any respect for the place. As I would find out, they were sponsors, and they were looking over projects of one of the scientists in the Garnet environment. They weren't supposed to be in here, though. But Smith couldn't do anything about it, and neither could anybody else, because unfortunately, that scientist had more power than everybody else here. And that was not a mistake. It was a feature of the space station. It took me a while to realize that I didn't even have to ask Clifton. I saw it clearly. Smith could only boss around the nobodies, essentially. Me, the other interns, Clifton, Hendrick, you know, the regular people. But the top and famous scientists within the space station, you know, the ones that know the executive officers of Fujikawa, those scientists got preferential treatment, and a lot of it too. One interesting incident was what happened in the Tiamat section. For four days straight, Tiamats went on a rampage. I was wondering if nobody was going to deal with it. The thunderous roars of the Tiamats and the shaking ground made my bones rattle. It was amazing how powerful those beasts were, and that strength could capsize the station. Finally, Smith called a meeting and everyone was brought to a conference room. Once we arrived, we found an angry Smith pacing around. I swore we were in terrible, terrible trouble, but we were not the targets, thankfully. The argument that quickly started was between him and the leader of the Tiamat team. Smith tackled a scientist named Williams to the task. You have been doing all these things and I never authorized any of it. And don't lie to me because I know you are selling parts out of the station. Like, this is funny. I've got the information that you are breaking the rules. Smith said. Since you don't want me here, I can leave. I don't need this disrespect from you. William said. Smith said. Fine, leave. Like I need your circus down here anyway. Who the hell would cut off the Tiamat's arm? You know they are protective of their young. You know you're not supposed to do that for no reason. So what? I can't do my experiments anymore? Williams asked in disgust. Don't insult my intelligence. You have a list of authorized things you can do. Mutilating the aliens is not one of them. And return the arm you cut off. You are not selling it on the black market because I know that is what you're doing. Smith gestured at the droids. 
Search his and his team's lockers, strip him of all tools, articles, and everything else, and get them the hell out! You will hear of this, William said. Your cousin could get me fired. I don't care. Tired of this! Smith walked off as the droids accosted Williams and his team, much to the shock of the other scientists. This is more entertaining than the soap opera I watched when I was growing up. <laughs> Clifton said. I chuckled, but I was deeply revolted by the news. Once that was over with, we got back to work. By the end of that work, Clifton came to give me and everyone else his goodbyes. He was leaving our team to take over William's spot on the Tiamat monitoring team. I asked, wait, hold on, you want to leave us now? I thought you liked it here. Clifton said, I do, but I want to run my own thing, and I was thinking of taking on an assistant. How about it? Why don't you join me? It's better than being under the old man. I looked back at the Asmoths. No, sorry. I like it here. Researching Asmoths is cool, and I want to know more. Plus, I don't really know much about Tiamats. Maybe in the future I can do that. Clifton said. <laughs> That's quite unambitious of you. I laughed. <laughs> Sorry for disappointing you. Don't worry, it's fine. I have to admit, you're a good expert on these little aliens, so I have to give it to you. This might be your muse. I could agree with that, and that's why I stayed. With Clifton gone, Hendrick and the others treated me with more friendliness though, so things worked out for me there. Months passed, and things quietened down in the living garden, which was, in my opinion, good. There was tomfoolery now and then, but at least there weren't any breaches. New interns were coming in, thanks to the regular turnover of the workforce. As a veteran, I was going to be training one of them, and that filled me with a sense of pride. Hendrick and I went to talk to Mr. Smith about it. Smith was complaining that the Tiamat's team was losing members like a burst water pipe. Funnily, Team Asmoth was more solid, had the least complaints, and many of its members had been around for years, with me being the youngest. Smith said, this is why I have to appreciate you, Hendrick. Hendrick said. If you want to appreciate me more, give me and my team a raise. I loved Hendrick. Smith said. It's on a list of things to do. I don't like to talk ill of the man, but I never liked Clifton when he was among us, and I'm glad when he left. Hendrick said. Hendrick rarely talked about people negatively, so this was out of the blue. Smith snorted. Well, you did write him up for suspension that one time. He did? So that was Hendrick. Did that mean Clifton talked up to Hendrick? Thinking about this did bring up one dark thought. The possibility that Clifton was the one who snitched on Williams. It made a lot of sense if I thought about it. No one was able to figure out who snitched on Williams, and personally, I didn't care much, because I didn't know Williams, and to be honest, I don't think a lot of people liked Williams. Still, it left a bad taste in my mouth knowing Clifton was just like everybody else at this place. He seemed so nice, but maybe I was being too critical. We went back to work, and things were great for a while, until an alarm was raised. We hurried out of the living garden and walked briskly back to the emergency checkpoint, as protocol demanded. Smith was already there. Now what? Mr. Smith bellowed. Hendrick said, You tell me. Don't patronize me, Hendrick. Listen, I just want my paycheck so I can go home when this is over. Did anybody realize that there was an alarm sounding off, or did nobody care? Arms droids ran to the living garden to suppress the threat, whatever it was. Well, at least they were doing something about it. But the best safety measure I learned was for it to not happen in the first place. The other workers came to the checkpoint, but there were no signs of the Tiamat team. Smith didn't say a thing. We already knew what was running through his mind. It had to be a Tiamat. After half an hour, there was no update, and all we could do was wait. And that nagging impatience rested over us as more droids came down the hall. But none of them ever returned. Sweat careened down a side of my face as I shivered in fear. Something wasn't right. Why weren't the droids returning? Lights flickered, and soon 
electricity fluctuated throughout this part of the station. Were the Tiamats causing the problems down there? It was a possibility, but the question that was nagging at me was the fact that I did not hear them. There was no ground shaking or anything. Tiamats were big creatures, so if something was happening to them, they would make sure everybody knew about it. Yet the silence was deafening, and nothing was heard. Hendrik stared at Smith, and all of us knew something was wrong. A surge of power ran through me at the dangerous possibility that was happening right now. Hendrik said, What's going on at the Tiamat cage? It's there, right? Smith shook his head. I don't know. All I got was an alarm. That's it. Hendrik said, Know what? Ben, Lennon, grab some protective gear. Tired of the stupidity. Rihanna, turn off the access corridor for the Tiamats so we can have them in the open. I went to lock down the switch. After that, I went to meet up with Hendrik and the rest of his crew. All of them were clothed in shaded hazard suits that were equipped with many tools, from tranquilizers to pressure boots. I had to be suited up and the helmet was suffocating, but it was to protect me from the dangerous air content of the environment. They gave me a magnate scanner to measure the Earth's tremors. Since the Tiamat's environment was a huge, grassy savanna, Finding them was never a problem with their size. It was trying to take down those behemoths. So, Hendrik and the others carried tranquilizer guns. They were built for shooting from a long distance. I was confused about using the scanner, but Hendrik had a hunch. We walked back into the living garden and found the fluctuating lighting got worse the closer we got. My heart was pumping, so I decided to talk to distract my mind. What do you think might be causing the lights to flicker? I don't even know. Hendrik said. You got the floodlight, yeah? I said, I have it. If anything, I'll be ready. You better not lose your rocker and get scared. Come on, Hendrik, I'm tougher than that. Hendrik smirked. If you say so. Once we reached it, I had to turn on the lights as we manually opened the gates to their environment. The electricity within the living garden was badly underpowered. As much as I wanted to ask if the living garden needed to be powered to be functional, I could see the fear on my comrades' faces. They've been here longer. They probably knew this was not a good thing. A horn sounded off in my ears before the crackling voice of Smith came over the helmet speakers. Hendrik! You there? Hendrik said. I hear you. You figured out what was going on? I don't know, and none of the droids are responding, Smith said. Hendrik glanced around at us with somber looks before saying, Listen, you need to call an evac out of the station. That's the way I see it. Look, just fix this problem, and I will do anything, I swear. Hendrik said, Fool, you do realize the electrical wall for the aerobound area is powered by the same electricity that's fluctuating right now. If that goes... We're going to have to evacuate this place. Tiamats are one thing, but they aren't that dangerous. The Asmoths are a pain, but the Arrowbounds will slaughter everybody. Smith replied, And this is why I'm telling you to fix whatever it is. I can't evacuate the place. There's other departments going on. Everybody's going to have my head. If it all goes to hell, you having a head doesn't even matter. Fine. I'll get the other teams out and tell the lead officer, Smith said. We walked into the environment, and it was the first time that I was beyond the glass wall. Our boots crunched into the grass, and already we felt so small. The trees were so huge, and the land was so vast. A whole city of millions could be built here. This was massive compared to our little rocky environment for the Asmoth. I remarked that there were no vibration readings from my scanner. And that was when Hendrik said the thing that sent chills down my spine. Of course, there wouldn't be. There probably wasn't any Tiamat here for a while. What? Was Hendrik serious about that assertion? That couldn't be true, right? We continued our track through the grassy fieldlands and soon found the droids. They were laying in scraps, 
around a Tiamat. But that Tiamat was as dead as a nail. Tiamats were huge, 40-foot beasts that have meaty fists and legs with spiked tails. This Tiamat was beaten to a bloody pulp. It was shocking as my heart jumped into my throat at the terrifying display. Even more disturbing were the Tiamat's eggs around it. They were supposed to be small as far as I knew, but these eggs were large and peeled back, revealing a white core, complemented with a slew of flower-like projections. But if I was sure, they were viral growths. They seemed eerily similar to one of the symptoms of the rage virus. It was a truly vicious virus, and it killed within one hour. But before that hour, the person would become a rage-induced, vicious monster. A crinkling sound made Hendrik and the others look around. Hendrik said, Rockford, get behind me, now. I made one step back, just as soon as I caught sight of the monster, walking on all four legs towards us. The longer I looked at it, the more I couldn't help but feel like it was a Tiamat. But it was slimmer, smaller, yet more defined in its muscles compared to the bigger original. Once this thing's eyes touched us with the sharp, narrow slits, we couldn't stop shaking. The ground gave way and dropped us into the pits of despair. Only Hendrik was unfazed as he lifted his tranquilizer gun and aimed it at the monster's head. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, but that monster grinned and those teeth bore fruit from the root of the gum, shined the light of my coming death. That's just like you, Hendrik, always standing tall, Clifton said. That was the last voice I expected to hear, but this was his holy ground. I turned in the other direction and saw Clifton stepping towards us. He looked different. Clifton had a certain glow about him. But if that radiance was sadistic, it didn't please me. It only sickened me. Rockford! Hendrik! So good to see you guys again! Clifton shouted. Hendrik narrowed his eyes at Clifton, but kept his gun on the new time art. What did you do? Just some renovations. Clifton smiled. Harm to the test subjects is against the rules. What the hell have you been doing down here? Hendrik said. Clifton replied in disgust. Harm? <laughs> it's an animal, Hendrik. You're acting like it's a human being. Let me guess. You've been experimenting to make an evolved version of the Tiamat. You're still doing the same old sick stuff, you slimy bastard. Hendrik said. Clifton frowned and grabbed his waist. We're both scientists, and you're calling me sick for creating something revolutionary? That's laughable. When all is said and done, you can call me whatever you want. But in the future, I am going to become a legend. Legend? I called out in distraught. It was infuriating. Who was this man I was looking at? It couldn't be Clifton. It must have been an alien I was staring at. I knew I should have killed you when I caught you back then, Hendrik said, before he spun the gun in Clifton's direction. The timer rushed forward, and my team fired at it. Hendrik's tranquilizer fired at Clifton, but Clifton ducked under its volley and ran off. So did we. Hendrik, a few others, and I ran out of the environment, leaving behind a good number of our team, dying at the timer's hands. Hendrik asked Smith, to lock down the Timot environment. I couldn't stop shaking. Once the gate was shut tight with a secure metal door, a loud banging sound consumed the living garden. I looked up and saw that Timot jumping up and bashing into the glass wall, separating their environment from one another. Plus, with each crack of its head at the wall, more fractures formed and grew out of the epicenter. Hendrik said, Crap. That's the Garnet environment. How is that thing so strong? That thing was trying to escape by any means. But more than that, a dangerous thought occurred in my head. I said, Hendrik, what was Clifton doing to the Asmoth? Hendrik said, Now's not the time for that. Droids ran into the Living Garden's work platform. 
I caught my breath and swallowed. No, you don't understand. I need to know. I think I know what he did to the Time Art, Hendrik said. Huh? A shattering crash occurred when the Time Art jumped into the Garnet's environment. Cries rang out as a huge battle of survival went down inside of that environment between two apex predators. Hendrik said, What are you talking about, Rockfort? I said, It's just a hunch. I think he used his research on the Asmoths to help him make that ab- abomination. You have to tell me, what did he do exactly? Did it have anything to do with the rage virus? Hendrik's face lightened, as if some realization hit him. The ground vibrated, and a chorus of howls breached our senses. Dying garnets were not the way I wanted to spend my weekends. Lights flickered again, as armed droids ran down to the garnet environment, determined to stop that mad beast. Smith's voice came out of the helmets. You guys need to evacuate now! Listen, forget it! I'm shutting the living garden down! Get out now! Make it quick before they arrive! What about the Asmoths and the other creatures? Even Clifton would be stuck inside, but I cared little for his ass right now. Hendrick said. All right. You heard the man. Let's go. Move it! We left the platform and tried to go into the next section, but all the doors were locked and refusing our ID cards. Hendrick called for Smith. He said, I have been superseded in my command. The droids are trying to lock us in. I'm gonna die. I asked, why? Smith said, Dead people can't talk. Hendrick rolled his eyes and said, No surprise there. Rockford, what were you saying about the rage virus? I think Clifton used it, I said. Everyone's eyes got big, while Hendrick's face hardened in contempt. Hendrick said, There might be something to that. That bastard Clifton was trying to do something to the Asmoths. Not even sure what it was. I don't even really care about those little aliens. But something just told me, let me check this out. I was right. I caught him with vials of rage virus on his person. Rage virus was such a dangerous virus. It was irresponsible to have it outside of its containment. Besides that, there was no need to use the rage virus on Asmoths. They were immune, unless my hunch was true. A loud series of cries rang out in the distance, as the loud thumping of broken walls descended into the shaking floor. They were getting closer. I said, I think he wanted to do what we've been doing, to make a vaccine, but we want to save lives and he wants to make a better vessel for the rage virus's good effects, Hendrick said. Wait, you mean the increased strength? I spoke breathlessly as my mind whirled. If I'm thinking like him, like a really mad scientist, what if I made a creature that could be immune to the virus but get the benefits of it? The antibodies of the Asmoths neutralize the virus. That thing he created, I think it is an immune vessel that channels those heightened benefits. That's why it's so strong that it went through the wall, Hendrick said. Ugh, you gotta be kidding me! The loud screech of the Time Ot sent a chill down their spines. Smith said, Clifton made a bio super weapon, and it's coming for the whole of us. We're all. Hendrick abruptly cut in. Have some confidence, Smith. We ain't dead yet. Rockford, you know how to stop this thing? Did he tell you about his little pet project? I shook my head. I wish he did. He never told me but he wanted me to join him on his team. Hmm. Damn. Okay. The rage virus has other negative effects, such as the deterioration of the body. Maybe I have an idea, but it requires making the Time Ot take some of the simulants fluid that we feed the Asmoths, Hendrick said. Yeah. The virus isn't neutralized, otherwise it wouldn't be so strong. It must be there, just suppressed. All right. You and I are going down there right now. Smith, get a hold of yourself. You got weapons? Smith said. We don't keep that stuff outside the tranquilizers. That's the droid's job. (sighs) Well, they did a terrible job. Come on. Anyone who wants to volunteer, follow me. Hendrick said. We ran down back to the living garden work platform. The platform was a mess. 
Debris fell over on the ground and we struggled to navigate the fallen concrete slabs, mangled metal and sharp glass sticking out. Our worst fear became reality. Huge chunks of the wall were gone. The light was barely functional as our flashlights burned away the darkness and sent it running. There was no way we were going to send these monsters running, unfortunately. As Hendrik and I took up each of the guns that the destroyed droids dropped, we went down to the platform, hoping not to run into anything. Our best wishes weren't always going to go as planned, for a huge error bound slid into the passageway haphazardly and blocked our path. Hendrik put his finger to his lips and waved his arms erratically to make sure we made not one sound. As a former explorer, he already knew. Either way, I was too frozen to even think. What was left of my heart was an empty husk as I stood there. After hitting the wall, the Erebound stood up, eight feet tall, in its dirty yellow fur, from the breakage of the wall, with four muscular arms. But it had no eyes. It never needed any with its amazing hearing. The Erebound spun its head in our direction, and then immediately got punched by the time up. Run! Hendrik said. He didn't need to tell us twice. We ran behind him and got swept up in the terror that gnawed at our sanity. The arm of the arrowbound swung over my ducked head as it grasped the time art and swung it into the environment wall, shattering the glass in a loud crash. I couldn't catch my breath as everything passed around me so fast. The crashing sounds behind us consumed our minds and made them chaotic and distraught. Hissing made my skin crawl, for there was something close. It creeped us out, and I was struggling to keep my head from snapping at each sound in the darkness that we couldn't reveal. A block of mangled metal dropped behind Hendrik and separated us from him. We screeched to a heart-thumping stop, and my eyes instinctively went up. That was when I saw those familiar tales of the infamous Garnet. A four-legged, stained black creature whose sweat bubbling acid would melt through the hulls of this ship if it wasn't diluted by its water-heavy environment. It crawled towards us from the roof it made its canvas. I stiffened in fright as my other comrades fired off their guns for the garnet to spin back into the darkness. The garnet swept behind the huge metal chunk and rushed one of my team members. He screamed as the garnet snapped him in half. Rockfort, move! Now! Hendrik advanced with the gun aimed, but hopelessness gripped my body to the spot. Even if I could move, the roof was melting and breaking apart as the garnet's acid burned into the metal, with a hunger to devour everything. As the garnet swung one of its tails at another person, sending them flying, the garnet hissed as it prowled towards me. I finally was able to get my legs to work and stepped back. The garnet showed its sharp teeth and was about to lunge at me when a figure hit the garnet in the head. We were shocked as we watched the garnet whip around in unbridled fright as an azimuth clawed at the garnet's head. The garnet tried throwing off the azimuth, but the azimuth swung under the beast's large frame and pummeled it over in a fierce barrage of its claws. I gasped as another azimuth passed right beside me. They weren't attacking us from what I could see. They were waiting on us. One of them looked up at me and made hand gestures as if it wanted food. At least, that was what he would do any time he was hungry. One of the team members raised their gun at the Asmoth. I waved my hand and put myself in the way. Wait! They paused, and I crouched to the Asmoth's height. Our eyes connected for a moment, and I understood it. Asmoths were dangerous, but at heart were still social creatures. Our period with them had built a kinship, even if we did keep them in cages. We were the only friends they had known outside of themselves. The Asmoth that killed the Garnet came over with its arms caked in blood. It looked up at me and made a comforting sound, as if waiting on me. They really like you, huh? Hendrik asked. I shuddered and smiled. I guess. Hendrik sobered up and said, This is all heartwarming and all? But we have little time. We navigated the falling debris, pushed through the daunting closing in of the walls on my life. 
and ignored the faraway violence wreaking this garden into a messy nightmare. We finally reached our section and found the simulant's fluid. The simulant's fluid was a compound we created that is used to break down the rage virus within a carrier's body. Asmoths can still carry the disease even if they are unaffected by it, so them taking it was always an option. But now, it was our best way to combat this new monstrosity Clifton created. Hendrik pulled out the contained capsules of the tranquilizer from the gun and gestured for me to give him the fluid. He dumped the tranquilizer fluid and injected the simulant's fluid into the capsules. A loud series of clamors and knocks ripped through the space station as the ground shook immensely. Was the station losing stability now? Hendrik said. We need to go. When we tracked back, we found the dead bodies of Erebounds. And what was the worst was that the time Mot created a huge canyon of destruction as we climbed over the many debris on our chase. Garnet stalled our advance when they attacked us, killing off everyone except me, Hendrik, and the Asmoths. It was getting dire, and the more we tried following the trail of destruction by that time Mot, the more dead people we found. The time up broke through the door and ravaged the blockage of droids before getting into the middle of the space station. It stomped down the main corridor, connecting most of the stations, and was crushing into each lab as if to stamp its disapproval on each of them for the fun of it. <sighs> it's gonna be hell following this thing, Hendrik said. In front of us was more rubble, and it looked like a hurricane ripped through the station. There was no way we were going to be able to get through this in time to reach the time Ot. I said, I say we check the elevators. It's faster, isn't it? Alarms were sounding off, and they became nothing more than an annoying buzz in my ears. If we don't do something about this, the whole space station was going to go down with us. Me, Hendrik, and the Asmoths jumped into an elevator and tried to get ahead of the rampaging time Ot. We stepped out onto a landing from the other side of the station. People ran around us in their desire to escape. The droids fired into the time up, but that monster cleaved through the droids like a knife through butter. Workers from behind the droids ran further into the space station. Hendrik aimed the gun and tried following the time up, but after several seconds of him moving the gun around erratically, he pulled it down from his sight in frustration. Blast it! It won't stand still! I said, do we have to get closer? Hendrik said. There is no way I want to get near that thing. I won't get a shot off before it kills me. That was when I saw Clifton walking in behind the Timot. Clifton whistled and the Timot froze. That was amazing control. Clifton was a madman, but he was a smart enough madman to be able to have a leash on this monstrous beast. Hendrik raised his gun but the time up sensed the danger and rushed forward, claws extended. The swung claws stopped inches from hitting Hendrik, for an Asmoth jumped up and bashed the time up's palm with its head. The time up recoiled and threw a swipe of its hand into the incoming Asmoths. The Asmoths bashed into us and we rolled back in a disheveled heap. My back soared with biting pain. The chilling growl of the rising time up caught us off guard as it stood tall over us. Clifton stepped closer and smiled. What is this? I lifted myself onto my elbow. The Asmoths growled as they stood their ground between us and the time Ot. Clifton smirked and pushed his hands into his pockets. You got the Asmoths on your side. What is this? The gun, Hendrik said breathlessly. I looked around with a frightening twist of my neck. That was when I caught sight of the gun, several feet behind us. You know, I always wanted to know which is the top predator, but your little children can't fight my creation, Rockford. They're old news. Clifton said. The Asmoths were tired of his talking and tried rushing towards Clifton, only for the time out to knock them into the ground, shaking as it stumbled up. I tumbled and hobbled towards the gun. The ferocious cries of the fighting drove me forward as I reached for the gun. My hand touched it as quickly as everything became dark around me. Drop, Rockford! Hendrik's voice guided me as I loosened up and my chest dropped on the gun. 
A rush of air swept over me as the time bot flew over my back and hit the wall of a lab across from me. That was way too close for comfort, and my eardrums pounded with the fierce beat of my frantic heart. I need to get up now. An Asmoth lunged himself over me and clenched its fist as it stood before me. The Time Art got up, peeling off the shards of metal wall and wires off its back and arms. My hand slipped under my torso and cupped the gun. After turning, I slid the gun along the ground behind me. Hendrik took up the gun, and as the Time Art smacked the Asmoth aside, it rushed, and I rolled to avoid being stomped on. He fired syringe shots into the Time Art's face. Timot swung his tail into Hendrik and sent his broken body flying. My breath hitched as I shivered in shock. Hendrik stopped moving next to two dead, blood-stained asthmoths. My eyes closed as my bones clattered from the horrible emotion. Tears flowed as my wet eyelids parted wide in puzzlement. The shadow over me was darkening my soul. I glanced up and saw the Time Art glaring down at me like some evil entity. Clifton stepped over the crippled body of Hendrik, and those thuds of his boots against the floor reverberated through my mind. It was like I fell through the floor and into the depths, wherever they led. Rihanna, I'm glad you're okay, Clifton said. My lips parted as I choked on my rising anxiety and it rumbled discontent through me. You can still join me, he said. I blinked and moved my head down as I pushed myself up on my hands and knees. My life could be saved, but this wasn't the way I wanted to go. I looked up and stared into his smiling face. Go to hell, I said. Clifton's smile died right there, and so did my chances. He said, You are a stupid girl, just like Hendrik. I replied, And you're a terrible person. Naive. If I didn't do it, someone else will. So does it matter? What kind of logic was that? I didn't get any time to even consider it, for I was lifted by the time art and subsequently squeezed by its large, tightening fingers. My body bent and twisted in two as my hand smacked the Time Ot's hand in a desperate plea. I gasped as I lost my breath and everything hurt. That hand released me, and that pain lifted off my body as I dropped hip-first into the floor. When I looked up in shock, it was the Time Ot and the Asmoth, and they fought fiercely over my stilled body. No, I needed to move, so I rolled out of the way as the Time Ot stomped forward. The Asmoth clawed at its face. Blood splattered onto my clothes and the floor. They went at each other's necks, but the Asmoth caused the most damage. I positioned myself in a sitting posture and watched the Time Ot fighting back. But it was like a tired boxer, and the Asmoth was maneuvering around it with flair and speed. The fluid was destroying the rage virus, so it was losing its strength. With a crushing swipe of its claw, the Asmoth ripped out the throat of the Time Ot, but the Time Ot pounded its head into the Asmoth and broke the floor in. A tremor rippled through the floor and jump-started my heart. It was like a symphony as they laid there, caught in an embrace. Both of them were warriors and died in the only respectful way a warrior died, in battle. Everything was gone. My mind bashed endlessly with a brutal tune. I groaned as I rolled onto my knees. Clifton's lips quivered in disbelief. I exhaled and steeled myself as the blood all over me made me want to throw up. Clifton said, What? No! It was perfect! How did I lose to that? I tried standing up, but my stomach lurched as the pain avenged me for thinking it was gone. Miss R. Rockfort? The voice of a droid called me. I turned around, just as the coalition of droids lifted their guns over my head. Freeze, Dr. Seabeck. You are under arrest. Clifton shivered, and said nothing as his mouth twisted in scorn. I inhaled, and swallowed my disgust for him. 
Because as far as I was concerned, if they shot him dead right there, I wouldn't have even shed a tear. Everything moved fast after that. I was taken into the hangar, where a lot of the ships were destroyed. There were dead bodies everywhere. It was clear, and not one soul was able to evacuate the place. This hangar was nothing more than a death trap, with a dead Erebound laying in the centre of a crowd of mangled metal pieces. An elite force of space marines loitered around it, as if it made them look braver. I was wondering where they were when we needed help. Those marines took over our escort. Clifton and I were separated, where Clifton got carted off onto a ship, and I was taken to a side room within the hangar. That should have been a hint to me about how they were trying to contain the situation rather than helping us get off this damaged space station. Smith called. Rockford! I spun around to see Smith walking briskly over to me as he entered the room. He hugged me, much to my shock. You're alive! Smith said. Who knew he would be so happy to see me? I said, yes. Yes, sir. Thankfully. He asked for clarity, and I told him what happened with me. Well, all of us, really. As he would tell me, he couldn't save any of the other people when the Garnets and Erebounds spread through the station. What could he have done, even if I couldn't do anything myself? Smith rubbed his forehead in distress. I never should have trusted that bastard! He said. That was the least of our worries. Because the Marines treated us like they couldn't trust us, we would ask them when we were going home, but they never answered any questions. They just stood there and told us to wait. Why weren't we leaving this place already? An hour later, what looked like the leader of the marine squad came to us with a man in a nice suit next to him. The man in a suit gave us an offer, and it was a slap in the face in my opinion. They wanted us to sign an NDA. I don't get angry often. But this was one of those moments where every part of my body shouted with unbridled rage. They came in here, and the first thing they said to us was to sign an NDA. He didn't ask about any of the victims or what was going on. Hell, they probably already knew. They have all these expensive cameras, and it was obvious they were watching. They must have enjoyed it, because it didn't seem like they were horrified by it. While Smith and I stood there, befuddled. I glanced at Smith, and he was staring wide-eyed at these people. Maybe it was because he couldn't believe it, or he was still reeling from the shock of the disturbing event that occurred on this cursed space station. So, after I almost died, all I get is a small severance package and I have to sign an NDA? Hundreds of people just died, are you crazy? I asked in distress. Either you sign it, or you're staying here so you can pick the poison that you would prefer. These people must have lost their goddamn minds. But as much as I wanted to make them pay for this, I wanted to get off this chunk of metal as much as anybody else. I didn't trust my chances of doing it on my own. Fine, whatever, just give it to me, I said. <sighs> I'll sign as well, Smith said. The man in the suit came over and placed the paper into my palm. I rolled it out and looked at the document. A pen was given to Smith and I, then we begrudgingly signed it. After that, the marines escorted us to the waiting ship, where we were taken off the space station and into a holding center on another planet in another solar system. I was surprised they didn't bring us home, but Smith said they weren't likely to do that for a situation like this. They probably want to run us through their stringent evaluation protocols. Once we landed, we met biohazard and armed units that screened us for any contrabands or possible biological threat that we might inadvertently bring back to civilization. And as if things couldn't get more infuriating, Smith and I were put through a four-hour processing seminar, which came off as nothing more than brainwashing to me, where they went on about how great their company was and why it was important for us to keep a secret. <laughs> Please. If they wanted me to keep a secret, it would have been easier to just give me a better position and a whole lot of money to buy me out. So, either way, they wanted to cut ties because they didn't want to foot the bill which was obvious by their small severance package. Or they thought if we lived, we could publicly absolve them of responsibility for this disaster. Their reputation was already in the pits of my mind, but they still wanted to sprinkle candy on it. 
I just wanted to go home. Once we were brought home, in a bit of a fanfare, I gave my statement, which was a bunch of lies and had my image all over the screens of many citizens all over the universe. The girl that survived a nest of monsters. People cared more about my survival than they cared about the people that died. It was surreal. But I had to hand it into the Fujikawa Corporation. They knew how to spin it into a positive fiasco. Of course, all those people were going to die, after all. The most dangerous creatures were there. So nobody was going to expect anybody to live. No one was going to think or assume that it was because of the company's bad practices. It was Fujikawa. They had a squeaky clean reputation before this. And even I thought they were squeaky clean, above board, and an exceptional organization. Girl, was I so wrong. So fucking wrong. All those exaggerated stories of conquest aided the brainwashing of the company in the public eye. Smith and my statement helped appease the governments. It made me sick to my stomach. But Fujikawa played this pretty damn well. Smith and I never saw each other again. It wouldn't be odd to believe that he went into hiding. So did I, for there was no way I was going to believe that they were going to leave us alone. We were useful for the moment, but once the confetti hit the floor and the news articles moved on to a new hot topic, we became liabilities. Especially at our pay rate. I wasn't going to get snuffed out silently, that was for sure. They were incompetent to keep me alive, so I took advantage of it. Within four years, Underground books that I wrote circulated about my experiences with the corporation and the worst day of my life. I hoped that I could prevent people from having a similar experience, to limit their risk, and to understand that Fujikawa didn't have their best interest at heart. The corporation needed to take some responsibility for what happened. I thought danger and risk in scientific discovery were okay, to an extent, but I learned quickly how far it could go if not kept in check. A wide-eyed fool was what I was, and I could have easily become just like Clifton in my foolish belief system. Funny, Clifton was found guilty, sent to jail for life, but got moved into a prison work program. Guess by who? Of course, it had to be Fujikawa. The prison sentence was a good way to blackmail him into working for them. Whatever work that was, it probably wasn't nice things. As for me, I was always going to continue my research and especially for the advocation of these misunderstood creatures. They may be dangerous, but they were only a danger because we put them in a position where they had to fight back. And if they were willing to fight back, so was I. Hi sci-fi horror fans, it's Kira Rhodes. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. And remember, stay cosmic.